There's a story in the public that the end of cash is inevitable. And yet when you look at the reality, you'll see that many people actually prefer the cash system. So you've got to ask yourself, where does the story come from? Welcome to the Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast from MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. This week, it's time for another book club. Every few months, we pick a book with an interesting take and bring the author on the show. For this book club, I talked with Brett Scott, the author of the new book, Cloud Money, Cash, Cards, Crypto, and the War for Our Wallets. Scott is an economic anthropologist, financial activist, and a former broker. And it's the experience he got from working in the investment world that led him to want to write this book. You know, when I was working in high finance, I actually felt that many people who were involved in these very advanced forms of finance actually frequently didn't understand the monetary system. I became very interested in low finance at some point, the sort of everyday monetary system that many people simply take for granted. They don't really think very much about it. They just assume that it works and then you can build all these advanced financial instruments around it. But I became very interested in, you know, how does the actual what's going on in the monetary system? And that's led me on, you know, for many, many years and into many sort of interesting scenes around alternative currency. And eventually it led me into this world around cash versus digital money. And I became aware that the public debate around so-called cashlessness was very crude, should I say, it was very sort of partial and it was very much conditioned to support the idea that quote unquote cashlessness was a sort of natural phenomenon that was just sort of occurring from the bottom up. Whereas from my explorations, I began to see that actually this move away from cash was frequently also being pushed from the top down. Over the last couple of decades, cash has gone from the primary form of payment in the US to third place, trailing after both debit and credit cards. For many of us, digital payments make life easier. Zapping your card, your phone, or even your watch can be faster than fishing out spare change from your wallet. But Scott says there's a lot more than convenience to the switch from physical cash to digital money, or cloud money, as he calls it. So you're trying to save cash from extinction. And what I would love for our listeners to understand is this war on cash. Can you just start by, like, who's waging this war? Who are the generals? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'll say is that, bear in mind, the reason why I'm writing this narrative is to rebalance the public debate. I'm not arguing that there are not people in the world who find digital apps and stuff exciting and useful and so on. What I'm saying is that the public debate is very, very heavily weighted towards focusing attention on those people, saying that the reason that we're moving away from cash is because that all of us you know, people in the street are the ones who are trying to drive that and want that. The war on cash story is designed to rebalance that, to say, look, there maybe there are some bottom-up elements to this, but there's also many, many top-down elements. And there are top-down players. And these include, for example, the banking sector. The banking sector runs the underlying account infrastructure upon which the digital payment system and card payment systems are built. The banking sector actively desires a cashless society. I mean, even the Bank of America CEO has openly you know, said this, we want a cashless society. Uh, it's not really hidden in the banking sector. This is well known. And of course, then there's the payments companies, Visa and MasterCard and so on, who for a very long time have been very open about the fact that they desire the demise of the cash system and actively run campaigns on that. The fintech industry is another industry that's involved in this because the fin fintech's all about automating finance in general. And to do that, you need to digitize monetary systems. You can't really automate the cash system, all right? And this also points to big tech because big tech also doesn't gel with the cash system. Amazon doesn't want to take cash from distant millions of people. And then there's a state as well. The state tends to be more complex because there's many different players in the state from the central banks through to you know, the tax authorities, and they've got different agendas. 
But there are certainly state players in many countries that have pushed against cash. For example, in India, this is a very well-known example where the Modi government in India actively demonized the cash system very, very heavily. So what's the battle plan? How do you push cash out? Do you start replacing vending machines that used to stick your dollar bill in? And now you have to have a card, you have checkout lanes in the grocery store that are like the self-check lanes where you can't, you can't hand over cash or how do you push society in that direction? One thing that's important to bear in mind is that in large scale capitalist systems, you don't necessarily have to have a battle plan. It's not like there's a coordinated conspiracy going on. What's often happening is that large institutions are acting in their commercial interests and they're doing so for a long time. And that will eventually slowly lead to the recalibration of the environment around us. In the case of, for example, if you look at Visa, in the UK, for example, Visa had a campaign called Cash Free and Proud where, and they actually openly stated this, the intention of the campaign was to make cash feel peculiar by 2020. And they rolled it out in 2016. If you go to London now, cash indeed does seem peculiar. But then what starts to happen is as you start to get adopters of these systems, so for example, your easiest community to sort of uh, get to is your young people because young people always want to differentiate themselves from older generations so they're the easiest to market to anything new is always very easy to market to teenagers so of course they they adopt these technologies which in turn become used by these companies to say this is the future you better get in sync with the future otherwise you'll be left behind and as that process accelerates you'll start to see what actually starts to happen is the infrastructure starts getting closed down So once a certain critical mass is hit, banks start closing down ATMs, they start closing down branches, they start reducing their cash handling facilities, which in turn, of course, makes cash more inconvenient to use, which then makes digital systems seem more convenient and people will find themselves choosing digital payment. And I think this is what's so problematic about the economics narrative around this is what economists will often point to is consumers, they'll sort of say, people are choosing these systems. And what I'm saying is like, fine, people do choose things, but they don't choose in a vacuum. You know, the other day I was at this London pub and London's increasingly loads and loads of places are starting to refuse cash. And I was trying to buy a simple simple meal from this pub and I was forced to use this app, which demanded that I use five separate corporations. They said, you've got to use Facebook or Google to, to log in. You then have to use your bank plus Visa and MasterCard to interact with me. And I'm saying, uh, why should I have to use these five separate institutions to do this simple interaction between you and me, which could be done instantaneously with a unit of physical state money, all right? That's not more advanced, all right? That's a intrusion, it's a type of enclosure where you're being pushed into something. And this is one of my big irritations with this idea that a cashless society is more advanced. Actually, if you're interested, if you define advancement as simplicity and even, should I say, elegance, I think the cash system is simpler and more elegant than the digital system. And it's actually a lot more resilient. All right? So I actually want to go against this idea that we have in the public domain that ever bigger and ever more complex systems are somehow higher or more advanced. I think they're actually often cruder and lower and subject to collapse. And this is the kind of thing we should be thinking about, especially in the future where you're going to have climate change events and all sorts of potential around cyber attacks and so on. I think it's a lot more advanced to be keeping these simpler, more elegant forms. So if if it's a war on cash, who who gets conquered? Who loses and what do we lose if we were to actually end up with a cashless society? Well, perhaps you should ask who wins is the first way to to say it. Well, who wins, of course, is the people who run the underlying account infrastructures of the system, which is the the banking sector, but then also players that are built on top of that, such as PayPal and so on, who all link into the banking sector. And then, of course, all the payments companies and fintech companies who rely upon this, and then eventually big tech. So that's the sort of first thing to say. 
whether or not you as an individual in society experience that as a loss or not partly depends on your position in society. So one of the big concerns is often raised about a cashless society is that it excludes a bunch of people who can't get access to bank accounts, all right? But then there's also massive elements around surveillance and censorship and stuff like the fact that digital payments can be watched and then they can be used as a vector for control as well. You know, in certain countries, people aren't worried about this. So, for example, if you go to Sweden, where there's very high trust in state institutions, people don't tend to think this is a concern. They sort of look at you as if you're a bit strange if you think this is a concern. But as soon as you leave that kind of high income democratic society, you'll find people have far more skepticism towards these systems, partially because they don't trust the institutions that it's built upon. There's just a much higher tendency towards centralization of power in large scale digital systems. If you picture the sort of quintessential scene from like a 1950s economy, you know, you can imagine these people walking down a road, handing over cash to a storekeeper. Now that store might be connected to distant corporations and buying its goods, but actually in the end, the interaction is quite localized and decentralized. Now compare that to a modern system where you essentially are using your smartphone to interact with Amazon. You can have much, much larger corporate entities when you're using digital technology than when you have these offline physical systems. Coming up, where did the cash is trash story come from? And what would happen to the monetary system and the consumer if cash goes away? That's after the break. Welcome back to The Best New Ideas in Money. Before the break, author Brett Scott walked us through what he calls the war on cash. Let's get back to our conversation. There's this idea, right, that cash is kind of trash, right? We're all moving in this other direction away from using cash. But you say in the book that pre-pandemic, more than half of all transactions that took place for, like, $10 and under were in cash. And even for larger transactions, I think you say 30% of all transactions still take place in cash. So we're not really close. We're not, it's not like we're on the precipice of, of losing cash, right? What's fascinating about the debate around cash is that there's a story in the public that the end of cash is inevitable. And yet when you look at the reality you'll see that many people actually prefer the cash system. So you've got to ask yourself, where does the story come from? And actually, I sometimes draw on the Gramsci, the theorist who talks about hegemony, cultural hegemony, this idea where people start to believe the interests of large corporations are just natural and unstoppable. So actually, many people, even though they continue to use cash, will have a story in their head that somehow it will eventually end and will be replaced by these corporate systems. Actually, during the pandemic, cash usage or the amount of cash drawn out of ATMs went up precisely because people are concerned about the stability of the banking sector. And actually, older people have got a very strong consciousness around this. They make a very strong distinction between you know, money outside the banking sector and money, quote unquote, in the banking sector. This is why my grandfather would have a shoebox with a lot of cash stuffed inside of it. Yeah, exactly. But young people are starting to forget this distinction. So this is a very classic example of, you know, hegemony in action. The fact that many young people have essentially forgotten that there is an outside to the banking sector. All right. They can't actually conceptualize that the monetary system, that there are forms of money that can exist outside of the banks, albeit the cryptocurrency movements are trying to create a sort of alternative imagination around a different type of digital money. See, I think this is a really important point in the book where you're talking about the resilience of the financial system, of the banking system. And you're you're saying that resilience declines with the rise of digital monies and the decline of cash. And I think that is really important for people to understand. And and I think it's, you know, it belies this idea that we're, we're just becoming more efficient. Somehow more efficient should mean more resilient. You're making exactly the opposite argument. 
If you're interested in creating a resilient monetary system, you don't want all your eggs in one basket. One of the metaphors that I use to describe this is the idea that cash is the bicycle of payments rather than the horse cart. You know, this idea that in, in many sort of digital finance circles, they present cash as this kind of old form that is naturally going to be superseded. Whereas in the way I see the cash system, I see it as part of a monetary ecosystem that runs parallel to the digital system. And this is one of the big things. Cash doesn't crash. Cash is an offline form of money. I mean, the Federal Reserve records huge increases in cash demand prior to hurricanes, precisely because people understand this intuitively. Right? Actually, in many situations, cash is a more advanced form of money than digital systems, which have all these resilience problems. They can be hacked, they're subject to cyber attacks. There's all sorts of stuff that's, that's problematic about digital systems beyond the fact that they facilitate you know, surveillance and corporate profit seeking. I think, you know, some people might see your book and see the title of the book and think, oh, this is like, a, you know, he's a Luddite, you know, against progressive advances in digital currencies and so forth. That's not it at all. You got interested in cryptocurrency. You got interested in Bitcoin, I think, very, very early on. You were one of the first, I think, to start really diving in and asking what Bitcoin was, trying to help the public understand it. What, what was it about Bitcoin that you found important early on? And how do you how do you think about it today? Sure. I mean, it's important to point out that the the Bitcoin community has a predecessor in the cypherpunk movements of the 1990s, which were very explicitly concerned about a future cashless society. And in that society, you might have huge state or corporate surveillance and other problems emerging. So we need to be proactive and develop a digital alternative that will protect privacy. Albeit it was only in 2008 that somebody put those components together and came up with the recipe for the Bitcoin system. And the most interesting aspect of Bitcoin really is the technological side of it. It's the fact that a network of people, or a group of people who don't know each other, strangers right, across the world, can use the protocol to coordinate the issuance and movement of tokens between themselves. But the problem about Bitcoin is its actual monetary design is extremely crude. So you have a very crude token system being implemented on top of a very sophisticated technological scaffolding. And not only is it crude, but it has a lot of extremely conservative elements in it in terms of its actual monetary ideology. A very heavy fixation upon hard money, this idea that you've got to constrain money in this sort of like quite unnatural way. So it's very, I want to say inorganic. All right. The way that I think about monetary systems is that they expand and contract and move with there's a kind of dynamic tension in monetary systems. And you can debate how well that expansion and contraction is managed and who gets to do it. But at some level, there's a belief in this idea that monetary systems are dynamic and sort of morphing. Whereas in the Bitcoin scene, they believe that you should sort of have these static kind of inorganic systems that don't that don't move with the underlying economy. And this, that has, creates huge problems. Just before we go, what is the biggest argument for someone who might be thinking, it doesn't really matter if cash goes away. It's mostly for people who want to transact and, and carry out, you know, illegal or other kinds of shady deals of one kind or another. Why should it matter to people who don't think that it will ever impact them in any kind of material way if, if cash becomes a thing of the past? For a start, I would say that uh, I would ask them whether they thought that their grandparents were criminals. And the answer is, in most cases, probably no. And yet the cash systems were very, very widely used in our grandparents' generation. So there's, there's no connection between cash usage and shady behavior. Um, in fact, many digital systems are used for extremely shady behavior. So that's just one point I'd say. But in terms of this question around why a person who likes digital systems should care, I would go back to this resilience argument. If you're not concerned about, you know, surveillance and censorship and so on, because I often get this a lot, you know, I get these people who are sort of, you know, hey, it's great, you know, digital convenience is wonderful. Um, and I'll say to them, you know, well, the flip side of convenience is concentrated corporate power. 
right? And then they might say, well, I didn't really mind concentrated corporate power. It's fine. I work for a corporation. And then I'll be saying something like, well, you should be concerned about the resilience of those institutions. And really, if you really want your whole society dependent upon that, you want to balance. Thanks for listening to The Best New Ideas in Money. You can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review. And if you have ideas for future episodes, drop us a line at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Brett Scott. His book, Cloud Money, is out now. To learn more about digital money, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast from MarketWatch produced by Best Case Studios. Suzanne Myers is our producer. Our associate producer is Hannah Leibowitz Lockhart. The executive producer for Best Case Studios is Adam Pincus. For MarketWatch, Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer, and the producers are Meta Lutzhoft and Katie Ferguson, who also mix this episode. Jeremy Binks is our news editor, and Tim Rostin is the executive editor for MarketWatch. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the MarketWatch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.